Let's say hi to everybody who's watching online. Would you welcome them this morning? Tell them you're glad they're here with us. We are extra glad you're here this morning. Today we're going to talk about why we fight for control. And I would love to tell you that this sermon is for someone else other than you or me. When I first started working on this message, I, of course, just like you, thought of some people that need to hear this one. Uh, you know, so I got to thinking about, you know, what is control like? How, how do we deal with that? And I thought about an egg and driving. Now, obviously, when you think of an egg and driving, you think of Marsha Brady trying to have the competition with her brother for driving, of course, right? You have no idea what I'm talking about. Google it. You know what I'm talking about. But here's the real truth about driving. I'm teaching my daughter how to drive. I've taught a lot of people how to drive over the years. I taught one of my friends how to drive when I was 16 and she was 15. And her parents didn't want to teach her. So I took it on myself to teach her to drive in Miami. She still gives me credit for her great driving. And by great, I mean great driving. So one of the things, though, when you're teaching somebody to drive that you have to realize is that too much control. There's, there's, we like to be in control, but too much control is actually bad. And so one of the things I try to, to say to people, and I learned this somewhere years ago, is when you step on the brake, step on the brake like you're stepping on an egg and trying not to quite break it. Now, this does not apply to emergency situations. And of course, I taught people how to drive before there was all this automatic braking for dummies because we don't know how to brake, so we just hit it as hard as we can and our car fixes it, right? But if you drive an older car at all, ever, if you jam on the brakes on a day like this, you're going to find yourself sliding through an intersection. I would love to tell you I've never done that. <laughs> and so I would say, hey, when you go to brake, step on it like an egg. And usually, let me tell you when I usually remember to give them that illustration. Right after, they break like a maniac and I go flying towards the dash and the seatbelt bruises my sternum. Right? The second thing I teach them about control is when you turn, most of you who've been driving for a long time don't even think of this anymore. When you turn, you cannot unturn the wheel. You have to let it go a little bit. So when you turn right, when you pull out of this parking lot, you're going to pull the wheel and then you're going to let go of it just a little and maybe push it back a little, but you can't control the wheel. If you try to, it's, it's going to be a bad day, right? So life is that way. Too many times with relationships, we don't realize that we're dealing with people and because of our need to control, we're crushing the people in our lives. We're hurting the relationships. We're defying what God has called us to do. And when I looked at this story first in, in uh, Luke chapter 12, uh, Mark chapter 12, I thought, you know, I'm one of these disciples in this story. And then I read a little more. So let me give you, because no one sees themselves as controlling. We all, how many of you know somebody controlling? You know somebody controlling. How many of you are sitting next to somebody? No, don't do that. Okay. So, so I'm going to give you just a few ways you can know if you struggle with control. And, and here it is. Now, a lot of times control is, is rooted in fear. It's rooted in self-doubt. So let me just give you a couple of them. Number one, always tries to change others. Nothing is ever good enough. Quick to criticize others. They avoid anything where they don't think they can do it perfectly. Number two, you focus on pleasing others. You focus on pleasing others. I, that sounds like the opposite of what control is. But the truth is, when we're trying to impress people, we're just trying to do an impression. If our main goal is not to please God, but to please other people, we're in trouble. Number three, never apologize. Number four, you can't let go of mistakes in the past of others or yourself. Number five, you don't like anyone to ask you questions. You like to be in control of the questions. Number six, you want people to do what you want and not that they want. In other words, you never go on it's a small world. Oh, wait, that's me. Number seven, you withhold attention or you change moods, uh, maybe even have a temper towards somebody, towards those who don't meet your expectations. When they don't meet your expectations, you withhold love or acceptance. Maybe you give them the silent treatment, or maybe you're the opposite, and you react angrily, mad, all those things. All of those are just signs of control. They're not all of them, but here's the deal. Our sin nature, from the time of Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve said, God, we know better than you. We like to be in control, because that was the temptation. That's the temptation for us. That's why you don't have to teach a two-year-old to say, no. 
No, nobody woke up in the morning and taught my two-year-olds when they were little, my kids when they were little, to say no. Guess what? They figured it out. My kids figured out how to go for that socket after I told them not to and look at me the whole time. <laughs> I didn't teach them that. They naturally do it. And we have things in us, but here's the deal. When you always seek control, you will not be able to have good relationships with other people. And your relationship with God will suffer. You will not have peace. You'll struggle with frustration all the time because nobody can ever please you. Nothing will ever be good enough. And, and not just other people. Sometimes the controlling is about you, and you are always thinking, if it could just be a little better, then I'll be happy. And so you're never happy. Wouldn't it be nice to settle in and have some peace and not have somebody banging on something in the <laughs> lobby? So here's three things. Number one, we like ownership, not oversight. We like ownership, not oversight. Now, let me tell you what that means. We like to be the boss, and we don't want anybody else to tell us what to do. And so even at work, you know, all of us know somebody who just starts at a job and tries to tell the boss what to do, and that goes really well, right? But we do this to God. And the basic premise of the Christian life is about surrender, you know, if you went to a traditional church, they'd say, come forward and make Jesus Lord. And nobody knew what a Lord is because we haven't talked about feudal lords since the 1300s or something. And so we didn't know what that meant, but it means boss. So you'll hear me a lot of times say, hey, allow Jesus to be your boss. And we will say that with our mouths, but the truth is, will we really believe it in our heart? So Jesus tells this story to the Pharisees. And by the way, this really ups the temperature, the, the attack that the Pharisees suddenly have with him for many reasons. So here we pick up. Right here, Mark chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 2. At harvest time, talking about the owner of the vineyard, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. Now, let me tell you the backstory on what was going on here. If you owned a vineyard and you had people work the vineyard, uh, at that time in Israel, you had to go and collect some fruits from the vineyard. Usually you do it every year, but if you did it for several years, and I don't remember the number of years, you actually lost ownership of the vineyard to whoever was managing it. And so the reason they did that is in case somebody died while they were gone and they didn't come back, there was a way to move property along and not just have property go fallow. But these people who were managing the land decided, you know what? We figured out a little trick. If we don't send any fruit back, guess what? We're going to own the property. We're going to be in charge. How dare they try to tell us what to do? But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. So he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat. Others they killed. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were listening carefully to this until this next sentence, and I'm going to tell you why. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. So time out. If you look at Genesis 22, verse 2, the Pharisees and Sadducees loved to talk about how they were children of Abraham. And when Abraham was going to offer his son, this is what he said. So Jesus is referring back to this story and saying, just like Abraham, God has sent his son, and what are you guys going to do with it? But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Why? They wanted control. They wanted power. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He'll come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And then Jesus says this, haven't you read this passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Now, this is also a big deal because Jesus was kind of making fun of them. So this is a very famous pa passage of Scripture. Uh, it's called the Hillel, Hillel, and it's in a Jewish prayer, and it's, it's uh, Psalms 113 to 118. And, of course, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, the people were yelling part of that. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're yelling part of that. Now Jesus refers to another part, and not only does he refer to it, he says... Aren't you familiar with Scripture? 
Listen, they would have said this prayer seven or eight times a year out loud with everyone for years and years and years. And Jesus says, don't you know the scripture? Because he was talking about himself being rejected. So then the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left and went away. You know, we complicate sin. A lot of people like to talk about the Latin. Sin means to miss the mark. It's an archery term, all that stuff. But here's the deal. The real truth for all of us is sin is any time that we want to tell God we're boss. And that's why Jesus could narrow it down to the two commands we're going to talk about in a minute. Because the truth is, most of the time when we you know, crush other people because we like to be boss and we're going to tell them what to do and how dare they mess with us, it's because of that simple thing called sin. As Christians, we are given forgiveness of sin, and the Bible says that we are given a new life in Christ and a new way of thinking, but I will tell you something. Those old habits, those old ways of thinking, that pride, that arrogance, that selfishness sneaks in. So here's the first question for you. Have I surrendered ownership to Christ? And there's an old song that just repeats itself over and over. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. Billy Graham loved that song. They did it at his, his uh, meetings all the time. Tent meetings, everything else. Why? Because all of us struggle with surrender. I think that's why the song's so repetitive. Because while we're singing it, we're like, you know, I do that. I do. Oh, no, no, I got to. And the Holy Spirit uses that to remind us of the little things in our lives that we don't surrender. When's the last time you were under conviction because of something you hadn't surrendered to Christ? I would encourage you, pay attention to whatever that is and say, God, you know what? That's where I struggle. For some of you, it's an old habit. For some of you, it's a hang-up that you have. For some of it's forgiveness of someone. For some, some of you, it's something going on at work. Maybe you're passive-aggressive, you know, in the way that you do. You know, you're going to leave that dirt dish extra dirty for the boss when they come, you know, whatever it is, silly things. That surrender to him. Can I surrender that area to him? So we want ownership, not oversight. Number two, we want rules, not relationship. Rules are so much easier. That's why religion is easier than relationship. Because religion says do A, B, C, and you're good. And the Pharisees love that because they could just do A, B, and C and say, see, we're good. We're good. It's like the old envelopes they used to have in church that said, did you do this? Did you do this? Do you do this? And you felt like if you checked it off, well, I had a good week. But God looks at the heart. That's the good news and the bad news. You know, the bad news about relationships is this. You can fake to other people. Somebody comes to you and says, Eric, would you help me move? And you go, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll be there. Can't, I'm looking forward to it. Right, Brian? You, you remember when I helped you move? Uh, you're going to... I'm going to remind you of that the rest of your life. You know that, right? <laughs> I'm just messing with you. So, so, the, you know, so we tell somebody, we like, but God knows our hearts. You ever look at somebody and you decide, you know, I'm going to act nice to them, but the truth is, I just don't like them at all. God knows your heart. It's about relationships. We all understand that so often... Uh, um, relationships are more difficult than just a little list of rules. A list of rules is much easier, we think, so often. So I skipped a couple stories. I skipped the story about paying taxes. I wish I could go into that today because there's a really cool... I'm going to tell you about it anyway. So the, the funny thing is, they did not have to use coins at this time that had Caesar on them or Herod on them. And yet, when Jesus asked for a coin, the coin the guy gave him had that on it, which showed that he wasn't really... He was really just asking a question. He wasn't really applying the principle. And in the second one, they talk about heavenly marriage. And that's a whole different argument for another day. So one of the teachers of the law, it says, it picks up here in, in verse 28, came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answers Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and all your strength. That comes from the Old Testament. And then he said, the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. 
You are right in saying that God is one and there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, understanding, and your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important, now listen to what he says, than all the burnt offerings and sacrifice. That's from a verse in the Old Testament where they were doing the right things, but their hearts were far from God. You ever do the right thing, but your heart is far from God? That's one of the reasons at the beginning of service, before we sing songs of worship, I try to remind us, this is why we're doing this. Because my hope is, while you're singing songs of praise, and it, and it happens so often during worship, that the Holy Spirit comes and reminds us, you need to forgive so-and-so. You need to confess this or that. You need to deal with this situation. I watch couples sometimes during the sermon reach over and hold each other's hand because, you know, not that they were fighting on the way to church. They were just having a very loud discussion involving that the other one was wrong, right? When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And I love this. And then no one else dared to ask him any more questions. Jesus said, hey, there's two commands that sum up everything else. Because at this time, and even now, they will talk about the 613 commandments. Even people who don't necessarily agree that there's 613 uh, uh, rabbis will sometimes refer to it as a 613. They're positive and negative commands like Steve talked about. And you look at all these commands and what sums them up? Love God and love people. And the way you love people is the way you love God. So if you hate people, how can you say you love God? That's later in Scripture. See, God has given us ability. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't need to put boundaries on people. Okay? So boundaries is one thing. Just like stepping on the egg. Just holding the egg. This is boundaries, right? And this is control. There's a big difference. And so how do we treat the people around us? We've got to give them boundaries. You can't let people abuse you. You don't have to let people hurt you. If you have children, you have to discipline them. You have to give them boundaries. But when that boundary makes you grit your teeth and you find yourself just crying. Are you really loving people or is it because you want control? Are you disciplining your children because you love them or because you want control? There's a big difference between those two things. That's the difference between disciplining in anger and disciplining in love. When we discipline in anger, it's because we want control. It's about us. When we discipline in love, it's because we want them to learn. How do you know the difference? Because your heart. Same thing with the way you treat other people. Think about it. When you grit your teeth, you typically grit your teeth when you want control. So do I value religious activities over my relationships? Do I feel more spiritual when I've gone to church but I was mean to somebody at work? The truth is God loves you no matter what. Did you hear me? Listen. No matter what, God absolutely loves you. When you fail and falter, you don't have to be there saying, God, I hope I can get my life back to you. Listen, when we confess our sins, the Bible says He's faithful. You know what that means? You're not, but He is. He he says, Thank you. I'm here. Just like the, that's why the whole prodigal son story is so awesome. God's waiting for you, waiting for me. Now, I want to give you something really practical. When you find yourself really frustrated in a relationship and you realize it's because you're trying to control the other person, you're trying to make them do or be what you want them to be or do. Instead of trying to control them, and I'm talking about sometimes the person that you want to control, it's for their good. They're doing something dumb. You see them hurting yourself. Maybe they're taking drugs. Maybe they're they're an alcoholic. Maybe they're struggling with something, and you see it, and you just want to fix it, and you're gritting your teeth. Instead of gritting your teeth, say, just like that song says, Dave, God, I'm going to bring them to you. Lord, I'm going to leave them at your feet. Lord, show me what I need to do. Lord, show me the boundaries. Lord, how do I properly give them good boundaries? Now, I can't even put it back together. I've crushed it too much. How do I give them good boundaries without crushing them? Lord, how can I put good boundaries in place out of love and not out of anger or control? So often, I just imagine myself releasing, maybe it's your children, Maybe it's a grandchild, maybe it's a next-door neighbor who does something ridiculous. I had a neighbor one time come to my house and cut down a tree in my yard they didn't like. Have you had that happen yet? Only your pastor could have that happen. I walked out, I'm like, what are you doing? I don't like this tree. It's in my yard. Yeah, I don't like it. It wasn't even in their yard. You know, it's like, what? So what do you do? Lord, I release that to you. I release that to you. 
Lord, I now put my fence up around that tree. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we want ownership, not oversight. We want rules, not relationship. Number three, we want compliments, not commitments. This is so true and becoming more true in our society. We don't want discipline. We want rewards. We want an award for everything we do, and we don't want anybody to tell us that anything is wrong. The trouble is, there are times that people have to say, hey, hey, that's wrong. As I'm teaching my daughter to drive, okay? Now, every car I've ever taught my, uh, somebody to drive in had that middle brake. I do not have a car now with a middle brake. And I'm trying to find the brakes on the floor, and they are not there, right? <laughs> but every once in a while, guess what I have to do? I have to reach over and, and pull just a little so that we don't go head-on collision into a truck, now, she could say, what are you being so controlling for? Uh, I don't want to die. And so we need to look, though, because sometimes the truth is all of us need correction sometimes. When's the last time in prayer you said, God, would you show me any sin in my life? Any area of arrogance, any area of pride, selfishness, self-centeredness, lack of wanting to go and help anybody? You know, the older you get, the more you just want to be left alone. Have you noticed that? You're like, you know what I'd like? Leave me alone. And we're more and more like the, like the old man who goes out front and goes, get off my grass, right? Except we do that with everybody now. We're like, leave me alone in my cubicle. Leave me alone in my car. Leave me, you know, right? Give me the remote, right? <laughs> Was that too close to home? Somebody went, who's me? So often our problem is we want to control even what people think about us. And can I give you a secret? You can't. You can't. You know, Steve said, Eric gets up here and says dumb things. I know that's not what you said, but that's what I felt like. You know, like, oh, I do say dumb things. And some people go, wow, it's so great that he's honest. And other people go, he's such a people pleaser. He's just trying to make everybody happy. So no matter what you do, there are people who will not like you. And guess what? That's none of your business. Listen to what it says here. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. So he's getting even more direct. Look out for these people. Why? They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the Senate. I mean synagogue. <laughs> By the way, these guys were not only religious leaders, they were political leaders. They, they had mixed politics and religion, and especially the Herodians uh, had, had gone so far as they're the ones who liked that John the Baptist was in jail. And eventually he died, and that's part of what Jesus is pointing out. He said, they love these places of honor at banquets, and then he says, they devour widows' houses. And for a show, they make lengthy prayers. They're all fake. They're all show. These men will be punished most Severely. Basically, Jesus is like, those widows are more important than these guys. And by the way, that's interesting in what he follows up with next. And then Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were being put in and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. Now, we know in another part of the story that the rich were coming in and it says uh, uh, blowing trumpets or announcing with trumpets. And there's two theories about that. One is they literally had somebody come in and go... Bow, bow, bow. Pastor Eric's getting ready to give. Everybody watch. And he would give in pennies, you know. The second one is that the, the way that they gave, it was a trumpet-looking device that went down to a box, and they could actually throw it in and make it make a lot of noise so everybody noticed. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything all she had to live on. Now, let me tell you something just about me on a personal note. I have no idea what anyone in our church gives. I like it that way. Not all pastors like it that way. You know why I like it that way? Because I want to treat you just as badly whether you give a lot or you... I mean, I want to treat you just as well whether you give a lot or you don't give anything. Because it's between you and God, not between you and me. I don't know what's happening in your life. I have no idea how much money you make. I've heard of churches that ask people for their W-2s. If your church does that, can I tell you what to do? Yeah, go somewhere else, please. Because that's control. 
We don't control and manipulate people. We say, God, you're going to provide for us. You're going to take care of us. And so last week when the insurance decided, you know what, we're going to pay you the full amount for those air conditioners now, which they did. God's blessed us even more than we deserve. And we didn't have to manipulate anybody. We didn't have to make a big deal. Oh, we got to do this and we're all going to die. We got to get... No, listen, God, you do it. And God knows our heart in our giving and in what we do, whether it's a show, whether it's pretend. So when you're dealing with people, pay attention to what you're paying attention to. Are you more concerned about if they thank you or that you're doing it for the Lord? If you mow someone's grass, are you more aggravated that they didn't thank you or even notice you mowed their grass? Or are you more thankful for the opportunity to serve other people? Because when you serve God, there's going to be many times where not only people won't acknowledge your help, they will attack you for your help. So do I seek approval from others or from God? Now, here's the final story today, and I'm just going to tell you a piece of it. You can look it up. It's called The Pineapple Story. You can watch it online. It's about an hour. It's about a missionary, a true story about a missionary. That when he went to this country, working with the indigenous people, he planted pineapples. And he and his wife were so excited because the food there was terrible. There wasn't a lot to eat. And so they planted these pineapples. They were looking forward to something sweet. They were tired of beans and rice and rice and beans. And all of a sudden, the pineapples were almost ripe. And the people of the village snuck in and took all their pineapples. The pastor was furious. Now, he still had some that were on the way, so, so he went and put up signs that said, stay out. He put up a fence around his property. And still, when the next batch of pineapples was almost done, the people snuck over the fence, took their pineapples. This time, he caught them, and he stood up and started screaming at them as they took the pineapples and snuck out of town. He went and had a talk with the chief and told him what a problem this was and began to yell at him about, how dare these people take my pineapples? And then one day he was praying, and the Lord convicted him that these were not his pineapples. They were God's pineapples. And so he said, Lord, you're right. Father, I submit and give these pineapples to you. They're yours. And the next time he saw people coming in and stealing his pineapples, he waved at them, told them, enjoy the pineapples as they snuck out. He couldn't believe it. Now, there's more to the story, but basically he went to, again, to the town chief. The chief came to him and said, hey, what's changed about you? And he said, well, I decided that these pineapples are God's and not mine. And so I've given them to him. He said, why didn't you tell me that they were your gods? Because our people who've been eating them have been getting sick. Why didn't you tell us that they were your gods pineapples? He said, because they're gods and they're not mine. And if you want some, you can have some. And the chief looked at him and said, you know, I think you've become a Christian. Too often the truth is in our lives is that we're so busy trying to control people. We're so busy trying to control circumstances. We're so busy trying to get everybody to measure up that we don't look like Jesus. It's okay to have boundaries. But when our boundaries slip into pride and arrogance and self-centeredness and selfishness, then we have to say, God, forgive me for wanting my way. I surrender all to you. If you're here today or you're watching online and you want to give your life to Christ, I'd love to talk to you about after the service. Basically, John 3.16 explains the whole gospel. God so loved you, so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son. He gave Jesus that whoever, whoever believes in him, that word for belief is to trust in him. It's not just knowing about him, it's surrendering to him. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. If you want to surrender your life to him today, You can do that. It's very simple. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Take my sins. I know you died on a cross and rose again. And today I want to surrender my life to you. Come and be boss, be Lord of my life. If you're here today and you're a Christian, the truth is we all sometimes slip and fall. We all struggle with control. The good news is at any time you can whisper a prayer to him. Lord, I surrender that to you. And the Bible says his Holy Spirit will give you the strength to overcome. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for your word and your power. I thank you for each one here and watching online. 
Lord, we all struggle with control and we're miserable because of it. So, Father, I pray as we allow you to have control, that the peace that passes all understanding would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We trust you, Lord. Thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great song.